two tasks. Well, first of all, maybe just to mention, I'm the Southern Africa Regional Scientist uh, working for FuseNet. And um, I've got two tasks today. First of all, to take you through um, El Nino, um, what, I, what it means and what its implications are for the, you know, the, the different areas that we work in. And then I'll zoom in on um, El Nino before uh, passing on to my, to my colleagues. So please um, put it onto the, onto the next slide, um, uh, Benya. So my, my, noted my, my first task is to look through, um, to take you through what El Nino is, um, particularly the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, please move to the next uh, slide, jump to the next one. And so it's, it's a naturally um, occurring phenomena which occurs um, in the Pacific Ocean. And it's got three states that it takes on. Uh, this can be either ENSO neutral, so ENSO there is standing for El Nino Southern Oscillation. So the first, which is basically what we call the, the what, which would be like the normal uh, phase is what we call ENSO neutral. Uh, then we also have La Nina phase and then we'll finally have El Nino phase, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Please move on to the next slide. So starting with ENSO neutral, um, and as, as I mentioned, this is what we um, look at when we, or this is what we have when we don't have an anomalous state of either El Nino or La Nina. So under ENSO neutral, it's basically uh, easterly trade winds uh, near the, the, the surface and the equatorial um, region, which are pushing, uh, warm waters from the eastern part to the western part of the Pacific, uh, are resulting in these warm waters in the western half. What you're seeing on the, on the screen there, uh, you've got the, the rising clouds, uh, in, increased convection because of those warmer waters. But that, this whole pattern resi results in a, in, a, in a circulation, which is called the Walker circulation after uh, Gilbert Walker. Um, and it, it has implications for the, for much of the world but if we move on to the second state um this is the um on the next stage that's the la nina and so with la nina we have um it's kind of like the new enzo neutral going into overdrive because we have these um the easterly trade winds they become stronger they push more of the warm waters uh to the to the west leaving the eastern part uh, having cooler sea surface temperatures um and that also causes changes in the circulation patterns and then if we move on to the third, the third state, which is El Nino, what we'll be focusing on today. With El Nino, we have some changes. It's almost actually a reversal in uh, some, of the, um, some of the typical circulation patterns that we have. You see there in the, in the graphic, those trade winds are, are uh, now blowing west, westwards. And that causes changes in where we have the typical convection. It also changes the sea surface temperatures. And because of these changes in the sea surface temperatures, we, we can use this as, a, as an indicator to monitor El Nino. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. But you want to just want to illustrate first that uh, you know these changes, although they're happening primarily in the Pacific Ocean, they actually have implications around the globe in many parts of the world. So for example, they while we focused on the Pacific Walker circulation that's uh, uh, noted in the, in the diagram there, but we have also other circulation patterns happening into the east, uh, which is in the Indian Ocean, uh, affecting the, the rainfall that we get over, uh, over East Africa. If we move to the next slide, we see that under the El Nino conditions now, again, while those changes have occurred in the Pacific Ocean uh, due to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, but that also has downstream effects uh, and impacting circulation in the Indian Ocean, but primarily, primarily in East Africa, there where we get increased convection, more rainfall happening in those areas. So if we move to the next slide, what we note is that um, this actually results in impacts on uh, on rainfall patterns around the world in many parts of the world and what this graph this graphic is showing this is work done by our colleagues at NOAA and uh, University of California Santa Barbara who looked at uh, El Nino events since 1950 and kind of picked the patterns that we see to identify those areas where we typically have above average rainfall during El Nino shown in the green and or below average rainfall uh, shown in the in the brown areas and the uh, the specific times when this um, occurs is indicated by the uh, by by the by the dates shown there so this graphic you can see it on the fusenet website uh, if you would like to follow up on that but we can move on to the next slide and there we see that uh, we can ac we actually monitor el nino using uh, uh, sea surface temperatures so the 
box you're seeing in black there is the part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean that we monitor to uh, determine what stage or what phase uh, of the El Nino Southern Oscillation that we're in. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we see that we can actually uh, Extract a time series. This uh, this is something that NOAA does on a regular basis. Uh, they extract the time series over that the average temperature over that box and allows us to determine whether the temperatures in that area are above or below average. As you see, the red indicating above average temperatures and those blue showing the below average temperatures. On the next slide, we see that we can uh, disaggregate this further by um, identifying thresholds and. Uh, Noting, you know, within a certain threshold, a set of thresholds, is enso neutral, and then when the temperatures go above um, above 0 0.5 degrees for an extended period, then we classify that as an El Nino. Or if they go below um, minus 0 0.5, that becomes a La Nina. Um, and then we can classify this even further, or as you see on the next slide, uh, by noting that by uh, discriminating between weak El Nino, moderate El Nino and strong El Nino, which all tend to have different impacts uh, in terms of the teleconnections, uh, those teleconnections between the Pacific Ocean and other regions of the world. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we'll now focus on what the forecast is telling us now for the current El Nino going into 2020, late 2023, early 2024. And what we note from there is that this graphic is showing an accumulation of the models that, um, or rather an aggregation of the several models that are run to determine what the future state of the El Nino Southern Oscillation will be, is likely to be like. And so what we pick up uh, is that we look at three month periods. And for example, the December to February, December, January, February period in the middle there, we can see that 99% of the models um, actually are giving us uh, indicating that it's likely to be an El Nino. By the time we get to the March, April, May period, uh, 78%, there's a 78% chance of uh, El Nino there. So uh, if we move on to the next slide, we see we can disaggregate this even further. Um, and Noah does a great job of this by um, indicating what percentage of the models are giving us a likelihood of um, strong El Nino in the deep red. So again, for December, January, February there, uh, which we typically uh, summarizes DJF, there's a 60% chance of a strong El Nino. So that's most likely through the end of the of the year to early next year. And by the time we get to March, April, May, we get a 42% chance of weak El Nino. So it's likely to be, we see the El Nino fading there uh, by the, towards the middle of the year. If we move to the next slide, this is um, kind of, this is a spatial representation showing that these forecasts for the December to February period, that red tongue that you're seeing in the Pacific Ocean there, uh, just uh, confirming uh, the likelihood, the expected El Nino to continue through the uh, December to February period. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. And what we see here is uh, this is an extended fo experimental forecast run by NOAA. And what uh, they have there, this runs out for the next almost around 20 months. Um, but what we see, the blue, uh, the blue bars there, uh, they become most prominent around the July, June, July, August period. And that's by the time that we expect the El Nino to be fading towards the La Nina phase. So we, we, the models are suggesting that the El Nino is most likely to end by mid-2024. Please move to the next slide. Uh, this is the outcome um, of the dynamical models that we use to forecast uh, using physical um, representations of what, of how the atmosphere um, and oceans behave. And out of this, these uh, dynamical models give us an indication of what you can expect in terms of climate. Uh, we've looked at two specific periods here, October through December, which is um, in the, for two, through the end of 2024, and then the December to February period. And what these forecasts are showing us is really in line with what we expect typically from uh, El Nino, uh, indicating that uh, this season is likely to be influenced by El Nino, below average rainfall in Southern Africa, for example, and above average rainfall in East Africa. We can move on to the next slide. And uh, from here now, I'm going to focus on the uh, Southern Africa impacts. And so the map on the left, you've already seen it, but that's uh, uh, zooming in on Southern Africa impacts for El Nino. Below average rainfall is expected uh, for much of the season, ex except in the northeast part in which we have uh, 
likelihood of above average rainfall associated also with the tendencies in uh, East Africa. If we move on to the slide in the, the map in the middle there, uh, sorry, please move back. Thank you. So the slide in the middle there, what that's showing us is there's a focus now on the probability of well below average rainfall during moderate to strong El Ninos. And those brown colors there are showing us that there's a high likelihood of below average rainfall when we have strong El Nino, strong to moderate uh, El Nino conditions, like what we're expecting this year. Uh, and the graph on the, the maps on the right are giving us uh, complementary data from temperature as well as evapotranspiration, both those red colors showing us a high probability of um, above high, uh, high maximum temperatures or, and high evapotranspiration uh, during El Nino conditions. Move on, please, to the next slide. And what we see here are some of the other drivers that tend to affect uh, what uh, the rainfall patterns in Southern Africa. Uh, these are based on sea surface temperature patterns in the Indian Ocean. On the left, we've got the subtropical Indian Ocean dipole, uh, which tends to affect rainfall during the uh, main part of the rainfall season. And then the Indian Ocean Dipole is the shown on the right there. Uh, sea surface temperatures again in the equatorial part of the uh, uh, Indian Ocean, and those tend to affect uh, rainfall during the early part of the season. Uh, and if we look, move on to the next slide, we see that uh, for the subtropical Indian Ocean Dipole, that's SIOD for short, uh, we are, ex there is, low predictability actually over this. This is what the graph on the right is showing. So we might expect it's currently slightly positive, very close to neutral, so not much uh, impacts at present, but it could go either way. Um, as you can see, those uh, forecast graphs through to June 2024, showing that there is a, a, a high level of uncertainty in what the, how the this uh, particular uh, climate mode might, might evolve over time. If we move on to the next slide there, we look now at the Indian Ocean Dipole, which typically affects um, rainfall during the early part of the season. And forecasts from this are showing a likelihood of a positive um, IOD uh, during the IOD, that's Indian Ocean Dipole, during the, uh, the October to December period, which is likely to cause, uh, to be associated with uh, below average rainfall in parts of the season, parts of the region as we, Southern Africa, as we see from the map on the, on the left. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so this now gives us uh, an uh, overall uh, of what we can expect, what the, what the models are, are saying. And what I wanted to illustrate here is how closely it's associated with uh, the El Nino conditions. Just the focus there to show that especially the, uh, in the main part of the growing season, uh, this, uh, there's a likelihood of uh, below average rainfall, which probably will be associated with um, uh, low harvests um, in the, for, the, for, the coming, for the coming season. And then for the all October to December period, which is typically associated with uh, the onset of rains, there is a lower predictability, but also there, there is a um, tendency towards below average, which might affect the onset of rains as well. And while we haven't shown the temperature, but there is, uh, most of the models are showing that there's likely to be above average temperatures, which is likely to impact on the, um, to, to ex ex exacerbate the impact of dryness. So at this point, I'll pass it on over to my colleague, Benja, to take us through the food security implications. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Muka for that great uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Benjamin Davies. I'm a senior food security analyst with FuseNet's early warning team and the regional lead for Southern Africa. And I'll be talking about the acute food insecurity implications for Southern Africa. So our current outlook period is September 2023 to January 2024. And Overall, our level of concern for the impact of El Nino on rainfall and therefore on sources of food and income related to agriculture is currently considered moderate to high in Southern Africa. For context of where we are in the seasonal calendar, we're currently in the post-harvest and winter season with the second harvest, often horticultural, occurring across the region along with the wheat harvest. Around September, October, households are likely beginning to prepare, to prepare land for the upcoming agricultural season and from October to January, we have the start of the rainy season and the lean season, along with the peak for agricultural labor demand. 
And then in the DRC, um, there's also a cassava harvest that tends to occur year round. So the 2022-2023 rainy season, so last year's rainy season, concluded with mixed conditions across the region with cumulatively above average rainfall um, in eastern and southern parts of the region and cumulatively below average rainfall across much of the central and western parts of the region. Um, additionally, rainfall was lowest on record in southeastern Angola, northeastern Namibia, and northwestern Botswana, as well as um, parts of southern Zambia, localized areas of western Zimbabwe and northeastern Madagascar. Um, and alternately, we also saw really uh, heavy rainfall that resulted in some of the wettest seasons on record in southeastern Mozambique, parts of Malawi, and localized areas of DRC. So with this cumulatively above average rainfall in eastern and southern parts of the region and cumulatively below average rainfall across much of central and western parts of the region, the various weather shocks resulted in mis mixed harvest. And you can see this on the GeoGlam map on the left, which, show which is showing end of season crop conditions in May 2023 with a bumper harvest in the maize triangle of South Africa, which is shown in blue. However, the hot and dry conditions in the western parts of the region and the impact of Cyclone Freddy resulted, resulted in a poor to failed harvest, um, which you can sort of, which you can see in the orange and red colors on that, on that map, particularly in southern Malawi. And then although not captured in this map, key informants and field assessments indicated that prolonged dry spells in February during critical periods of water for maize resulted in a below average and poor harvest in southwestern Mozambique and southern Malawi. And then on the right, um, the with the wheat um, harvest about to take place, GeoGlam assesses that wheat conditions are favorable across the region with wheat harvesting underway in Zimbabwe while crops are continuing to develop well in Zambia, South Africa and Lesotho with that harvest expected to take place in October. So with that with the major harvest for southern africa uh, coming to an end may supplies in southern africa are expected to be slightly above average during the 2023-2024 marketing year while regional opening stocks for this marketing year are below average supplies are expected to be supported by that above average regional harvest um, aggregate may supply for this marketing year is estimated at six percent above 2022-2023, which was last year, and 9% above the five-year average, driven by the bumper harvest recorded in South Africa and Tanzania. The Southern Africa region, uh, which is typically self-sufficient in maize, is expected to maintain a minor surplus. However, these surpluses will be 10% below average due to reduced opening stocks and increased demand. Domestic deficits uh, are expected to continue to be met through sourcing maize from regional markets. Across the region, staple food prices have stayed largely stable or are beginning to increase with the approaching start of the lean season. And you can see this in the four selected markets um, across the region. So we have uh, white maize grain prices in South Africa in the top left, rice prices in Madagascar in the top right, uh, and then maize grain prices in Mozambique in the bottom left, and then maize grain prices in Malawi. So with that and the more and the recent prices for the current year are shown in green on the on, on the different graphs. So however, um, overall prices are higher than the five year average, which is the tan columns and higher than prices that compared to last year, which are the orange dots across most of these selected markets. But in areas that were quite affected by shocks um, in the last production year, maize, is, are, maize prices are higher than both last year and the five year average. And you can really see this in Mutundu, Malawi in the bottom right. Another key driver in the region are macroeconomic conditions. And across the region, macroeconomic conditions are mixed with annual inflation rates ranging from around 4.8 to 5.2% in Lesotho, Mozambique, and South Africa to around 30% in Malawi as shown by the table on the left. When looking at the trend of inflation rates, which is the figure on the uh, right, we can see that inflation rates have remained elevated in Malawi, which is the brown line over the last year, along with um, DRC, which is the green line. However, in Zimbabwe, the statistics agency in September changed its methodology for calculating inflation for the second time this year after introducing a blended inflation rate in March to reflect the increased use of US dollars in the economy, which now makes up uh, an estimated 80% of all transactions. So with this new methodology that they just released, inflation is now calculated to have declined from around 60% from October last year to 
around 18% in September. Across the rest of the region, though, inflation rates have largely stayed stable over the past year. So as we look forward to, through January 2024, close monitoring of the progress of the 2023-2024 rainy season in South Africa is going to be critical, as historical trends indicate El Nino typically brings below average rainfall to the area, as well as an erratic and delayed start to the rainy season. Historically, the likelihood of below average rainfall is strongest across the region from December to March, as Tamuka um, described, which is also the peak of the rainy season and a critical period for moisture as crops enter that reproductive growth stage. Historically, there is typically at least a 60% chance that rainfall in this December to March period is likely to be less than the 33rd percentile of average rainfall during an El Nino. In the October to January period, below average and erratic rainfall will likely lead to reduced planting and, and reduced agricultural labor income during the lean season, while food prices are anticipated to remain elevated and weak, amid weak and unstable economies. So moving now to most likely outcomes, most households across the region are at the start of, that, of the 2023-2024 agricultural season and are likely engaged in land preparation. Uh, staple food prices, uh, staple food supplies, sorry, are stable across, uh, stable in parts of the region where rainfall performance was average to above average, including um, surplus producing areas of Lesotho, northern parts of Zimbabwe, central and northern Malawi, northern and central Madagascar, and northern Mozambique. In these um, house areas, households are experiencing minimal IPC phase one or stressed IPC phase two outcomes um, driven by the high cost of living. And this is captured in our most likely outcomes. Um, Map, mapping um, on the left. However, as household, um, and this is the green and yellow uh, colors in that map for those not familiar with the FuseNet maps. So, however, as household foods access to food stocks decline and reliance on market purchases increase, there'll likely be an increase in the number of households experiencing stressed IPC phase two or crisis IPC phase three outcomes from October to January particularly in areas where there was a below average 2023 harvest, such as in Southern Zimbabwe, Southern Mozambique, Southern Malawi, and Southern Madagascar. In these areas, household food stocks will likely de deplete atypically early. Additionally, below average rainfall will likely lead to reduced planting and agricultural labor income during the lean season, which will further impact household purchasing power and access to food during the lean season, with crisis IPC phase three outcomes expected prior to the peak of the lean season. Additionally, Food assistant needs are expected to rise during during the 2024 lean season and will, um, particularly from that January to March period. Um, I'll also take this moment to just note that in October, at the end of this month, FuseNet will be publishing um, the October 2023 to May 2024 food security outlook reports, which will incorporate our ongoing analysis for the most likely scenario for this time period. And then in February 2024, the food security outlook report that is covering February through September 2024 will be published. Looking at regional food assistance needs, they're likely to, go, to be similar to last year um, in the October to March 2024 period with areas of greatest concern being Eastern DRC, Southern Malawi, Southern and Western Zimbabwe, Cabo Delgado and Southern Mozambique, as well as Southern Madagascar. So looking at sort of at long-term considerations outside of the current scenario period, um, as we look long-term and, and, and consider those other events that could change the scenario, on this slide, you'll see the period of highest concern for Southern Africa regarding the impact of El Nino on agricultural and livestock production. And this is likely going to be from February 2024 onwards, as February is around the time rainfall is likely to be most impacted by the El Nino and crops typically would be reaching those water critical periods in their development, along with anticipated decline in pastures. Additionally, if below average rainfall materializes, then FuseNet would expect um, the 2024 harvest, particularly for rain-fed agricultural areas in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, and Southern Malawi to be below average. Poor households are typically able to withstand one bad, fall rain, one bad rainfall season. However, the household coping capacities in these areas is, is limited due to multiple weather shocks over the past six years. And the 2023 crop production was already below average in Southern Mozambique, Southern Malawi, and Southern Zimbabwe. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Gideon to go over the climate drivers for East Africa. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Gideon Galu, Regional Field Scientist for Eastern Africa. I'll be providing a brief on uh, key climate drivers for our region and the expected uh, outcomes in terms of rainfall, temperature, and agricultural productivity. Next slide, please. So uh, I start with the most influential climate driver, that's the Indian Ocean Dipole, Tamuka did discuss that in detail, but uh, what I wanted to relate to this is it's the most influential climate driver for a region because it's in proximity to Eastern Africa. So what we look for is the different phases of uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole. At the moment, we have a very strong Indian Ocean Dipole at plus 1.85 degrees Celsius, and that is based on differential temperatures between the East Indian Ocean, indicated there as EOI, and the West Indian Ocean, which is at adjacent to a region, which is showing warmer than normal conditions. So this is influencing a lot of uh, strong easterly winds that bring a lot of uh, moisture and fuel, uh, convective development, and lots of rains in our area. So again, that's an area we are looking at. At the moment, we are almost comparable to 2019, which was an event that had widespread extreme rains across Eastern Africa. Uh, fortunately, this uh, event is also likely not to continue beyond January for the Indian Ocean. And as for the El Nino event, we anticipate that it will continue into next year. So next slide, please. So looking at uh, forecasts that were provided by uh, the Climate Hazard Center, working for FuseNet, the long lead forecast, which is statistical, looks at uh, the sea surface temperatures for these key climate drivers, the El Nino and also the Indian Ocean Dive. 2023, this year, we are getting very close to what was almost similar in 1997, 1982, 2006, 2015, and 2019. More recent analysis uh, as of uh, this week are indicative of the fact that uh, that has shifted upwards and we're getting closer to 2019, as you've seen from the Indian Ocean Dipole. But in terms of El Nino, we are relatively slightly less than 1997. So we are looking at a number of analog years that would provide us with the uh, scenarios for upcoming season, together with uh, the global climate outlooks, uh, the regional and also national focus. Next slide, please. Um, not able to see it from my side. I think it's a bit slow. We see the slide. Gideon. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not able to see the next slide. So, um, yeah, thank you. Right so uh, again, a uh, strong PIOD and that, El Nino uh, rainfall um, impact statistical slide. approach, we are able to identify some similar years with strong uh, positive in the ocean dipole. Yeah, I can I can see that. Thanks. So um, looking at uh, the years that have been identified uh, statistically to be almost similar scenarios, uh, they range from We might have lost Gideon. Tamuka, do you would you be comfortable taking over in the meantime while Gideon gets back online? Uh, oh, Gideon, you're back. Sorry for my uh, poor connection. I uh, will take it back to the scenarios we are looking at based on all similar conditions, both in the Indian Ocean and uh, 
the Pacific Ocean. The years that were identified from that statistical model were 1982, 94, as uh, much less in terms of uh, El Nino conditions, 97, 2006, 2015, and 2019. In all these years, you see uh, typically across the region, we had above average rainfall of almost two times what we typically get. But the extreme years like 97 and 2019, we are seeing more of extreme rainfall and in areas like Somalia, northeastern Kenya, and uh, eastern Ethiopia, to the southern regions of Ethiopia, we are seeing almost three times what we'd normally get. So the latest focus are also indicative of the fact that we will be probably looking at close to 2019 and uh, 1997. Next slide, please. Yeah, unfortunately, my uh, connection might be a bit lower. I'm not able to see you moving the slides from your side. Have you moved to the next slide? Yes, it's on recent flash floods in Baidoa. I think you're on mute. To the next slide, please. Uh, Gideon, I think you were on mute while you were describing the, the, the slide on flash floods in Baidoa. Hello, Benja. Yes, hi, Gideon. I think you were on mute when yeah, you were you describing the slide fast. on recent I was flood. on the, um, I'm sorry about this. Uh, can we go back? No, um, I think it's the connection which is not good. So I was uh, trying to request if you could go back to the slide where I had a, a range of That's true. Hello. Benjamin, yes, I, are you able to I hear me? I think. Yeah, I can hear you. Are you? Hello. You want you want to be on the strong PIOD slide? Gideon, are you there? Hello. Yes, hi, Gideon. We can hear you. If I was just trying to call me. Yeah, sorry. It seems like I have an intermittent uh, connection. So I was giving a range of uh, possibilities in terms of selected or identified analogies. Mm -hmm. And that's the full range. If you look at all those maps, you see uh, much of Eastern Africa is likely to have above average rainfall with the varied uh, intensities. The years that we have focused on are indicated there, and the extreme years are 97 and 2009. From IOD perspective, we are getting closer to 2019 and uh, relatively uh, uh, less intense as in 1997. So those are the scenarios we'll be developing shortly. So next slide, please. Yeah. Um, Again, you'll recall very recently we had flash floods uh, in Baidoa, Somalia, and this really comes in the as a reflection to the early season and uh, intense rains that uh, always cause flooding in some of these areas. So the rain gauge information that we got from Somalia from partners was indicative of very high rainfall, especially in the northern and, and southern regions. 
and the number of people already affected by floods as of 4th of October were over 100,000. Next slide, please. In, in terms of uh, the scenarios, you know, aggregated over the uh, number of uh, analog years that we are looking at, we have come up with two uh, scenarios. One is the most likely scenario, which is an average of all those years that we've provided, and the worst case scenario is looking at 1997. So again, in both years, we, I mean, in both scenarios, we look at excessive rainfall, but 1997 seems to be catastrophic in terms of uh, heavy rainfall. And we'll recall that for Somalia and parts of Eastern Horn, we had a lot of uh, floods, flash floods, a lot of people displaced and uh, cropped areas affected. I'll go into details about that. Next slide. In terms of uh, the onset, uh, we had uh, made earlier uh, scenarios indicative of the fact that uh, we'll see the rains getting established more in October. That's this month and into early November for the southern region. regions in Tanzania, but uh, again, for the West, the rains have already started, and also for Southern Ethiopia into Southern Somalia, the rains are ongoing at the moment, as I showed, uh, incidences of flooding occurring in our assumptions, and we are likely to see the peak of rainfall occurring in October. And then in some areas, it's ending in November into December. That's for the northern parts of our region, that's Somalia, uh, southern uh, Ethiopia. But as we go to the southern regions, the rains are likely to get established in November and peak at that time into December. So again, the peaks. Uh, also likely to be associated with flooding in some areas. So those are the areas we need to look into. These rains are expected to spill over into next year based on the analog uh, outcomes as presented there in those graphs. Next slide, please. Again, in going into the dynamical or physical forces that were also provided by Tamuka, the two areas that we are looking at, uh, one is all these focus provide consensus in terms of above average rainfall for East Africa. That's uh, the region indicated in green there with probabilities of uh, over 50% to 70% in Southern Somalia and Eastern Kenya. But the point I really wanted to emphasize is that these above average rainfall are also expected to spill over into uh, next year. That's the December through February with hotter than normal conditions. So we are likely to see an extended uh, uh, length of the growing period for the entire period. That's uh, October through December into early next year. There was a slight typo there, I changed it online. So moving on, uh, next slide is uh, with the abundant rainfall and expected extended length of the growing period, we are likely to see better than normal cropping conditions across much of uh, East Africa, which depend on the October through December rain. Uh, areas that I'm uh, specifically focusing on is uh, Southern Ethiopia, Southern Somalia, Coastal Kenya, yeah, much of Southeastern Kenya, and also to the West, we are looking at uh, Western Kenya and Bermuda. 
central regions of uh, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, all are in green indicative of possibility of uh, above average yield. I also have a graph there indicative of uh, yield conditions, uh, I mean production conditions for the last Ten years provided by the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya for two areas of uh, eastern and coastal Kenya. And in the years that were identified as analog years, that's 2015, 2019, we've had above average cereal production, and our estimate for here is likely to be above average. The gray bar indicative of what the Ministry of Agriculture. agriculture was providing, but with abundant rainfall, we we'll anticipate that this would be much higher than indicated in that grave bar estimate. Next slide, please. Gideon, um, for time's sake, and to be, I think maybe let's let's move on to the acute food insecurity outcomes um, for East Africa, and we can circulate the slides um, at a later point. Dana, over to you. Thanks, Benja, and thanks, Gideon, for uh, the um preliminary information on um expectations for climate drivers and um agroclimatology i'll reiterate some of the points gideon was going to make at the end of his presentation um i'll also try to make up some time here so uh, have a sip of coffee and i'll be moving pretty quickly um, my name is diana bartone senior food security analyst uh, and lead for the horn of africa region uh, and i'll be going through the acute food insecurity um, impacts of above average rainfall expected in the region. Um, thanks, Benja. So this is a look at East Africa's regional seasonal calendar, very simplified. Um, and we'll start by looking at the recently concluded June to September rainy season in the Western sector of the region, which has been characterized by atypically dry conditions linked to the strengthening El Nino. Slide, please. And we'll start with Ethiopia, where the impacts of rainfall deficits during the season have been the most severe. You can see uh, from the map that seasonal deficits in many current receiving areas range from 10 to 40% or more of normal seasonal totals, with parts of SNNPR, Aromi, and Afar expected to be facing record low rainfall totals and or ongoing drought conditions. And so in terms of impacts, the key takeaways are that the poor current rainfall together with conflict and limited access to agricultural inputs are together expected to result in a below average Meher harvest um, in eastern parts of Tigray, eastern Anpara, SNNPR, and along the Rift Valley in Aromia. And negative impacts on pastures in the north are also um, being ex experienced. Slide, please. Now, in the Sudan's cumulative deficits during the June to September season have not been as severe, but there have been some localized impacts of uh, rainfall deficits and erratic rainfall coupled with above average temperatures. So in Sudan, um, this has affected some southeastern areas, and this is exacerbating negative impacts on, of conflict on crop production. Um, conflict is the major driver of expectations for below average below average crop production, however. And in South Sudan, there is some concern for localized rainfall deficits in the Southeast where negative impacts of on crop production have been reported. However, crop production is still expected to be near average at the national level. Slide, please. And in Karamoja, which is the unimodal area of Uganda in the Northeast, the April to September rainy season has also been below average, contributing to below average crop production outcomes. Slide, please. 
So now we'll shift focus to the upcoming, um, starting now, October to December, short rains or dare season. Um, slide, please. And we'll first talk about region-wide impacts related to crop production. Gideon already presented this map uh, showing most likely cropping conditions in the Horn based on analog years, but the key takeaways are also relevant for bimodal Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. And the main takeaway for food security is that we expect above average rainfall in the October to December season to have overall positive impacts on crop production, and this will support poor households' access to income from agricultural labor and during subsequent harvest periods on their access to food and income from crop production and sales. However, heavy rainfall and flooding is expected to cause some damage to standing crops as well as to food stocks from the prior long rain season. And in riverine areas, flooding is expected to substantially disrupt main season agricultural activities, but will later bring about improved opportunities for recessional cultivation once the floods recede. Slide, please. In terms of expectation for pasture and livestock production, the key takeaway is also one of overall positive impacts. Um, you can see here from the map that pasture conditions are currently below average. This is also a time of seasonally low levels of pasture availability across the region. The chart shows the trend of seasonal improvement that usually occurs um, during the rainy season that's upcoming. And the above average rainfall forecast is expected to enhance the trend of seasonal improvement. And, and this will support um, livestock births and access to milk during the rainy season. However, heavy rainfall and flooding will also come with elevated risk of livestock and human disease incidents in affected areas. Slide, please. These are FuseNet's projected acute food security outcomes in the region for October to January, and these projections were made in August, September. And overall, the mapped outcomes do generally reflect expectations for seasonal improvement in this period due to improvements in crop and livestock production during the October to December rainy season. However, across much of the Horn and, and the Sudan, severe acute food and security outcomes in line with crisis and emergency are anticipated to persist in large part due to the lasting impacts of the historic five season drought in the Horn alongside the impacts of recent and ongoing conflicts. And I would note the pause in US government assistance in Ethiopia is also expected to contribute to severe outcomes. And in terms of takeaways regarding how El Nino is factored into our analysis, um, first the below average crop and livestock production um, following the June to September rains is expected to um, reduce households' typical available food and income in the October to January period, though greater concern exists once households exhaust food stocks beyond this projection period. And in the areas with rainy seasons spanning October to December, the Eastern Horn, Bimodal South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, we expect overall positive impacts um, on crop and livestock production will generally support access to food and income, though flood prone riverine and low lying areas are likely to experience substantial negative impacts and deterioration in acute food insecurity um, in these localized flood affected areas um, alongside human displacement, disruption to livelihoods and damage to infrastructure, crops uh, and livestock. And finally, uh, if we do see a credible worst case scenario where rainfall is even heavier than currently projected, this would lead um, to worse food security outcomes than what you see mapped. Slide, please. And this is a look at FuseNet's analysis of past and projected food assistance needs. You can see the trajectory of seasonal improvement that we expect, though I would note that in flood affected areas, um, needs will actually increase during that same time period. Slide, please. And I won't go through this, but I'll leave you with this information on food security impacts of severe flooding that occurred in 1997 to get a better sense of what we might see should a worst case scenario manifest. Uh, and now with that, I'll hand it over to Al Khalil for uh, West Africa. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, hi to everybody, uh, my name is Al-Khalil Adum and I'm the uh, regional scientist for West Africa and the Sahel. 
Uh, yeah, let's uh, move forward and we'll, uh, talk about the uh, El Nino and its implications for uh, rainfall in our region. And uh, as you can see in this slide, we have uh, picked two uh, weak and moderate uh, El Nino analog years. Uh, and that's the left hand side uh, panel, and uh, on the right hand side is for the uh, what selected as strong El Nino analog years. And as you could see in this uh, two, um, the, the 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 impact, the the, the 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 relationship between our rainfall and the El Nino events are not really that strong. And uh, please uh, uh, ignore what's there. That's uh, the Sahara Desert. Uh, what's in the north? So it is uh, like uh, this is an area where you could uh, see the dark uh, um, uh, um, uh, anomalies. Uh, you, you have received maybe a, a, a few rainfall events, uh, sometimes none in the Sahara Desert. So, but we are talking about uh, the area really uh, that where it's a little uh, clear that's uh, where the agriculture and the agro pastoral area. Uh, so in this area, really. Uh, the, the, the El Nino is related to dryness, but uh, it's not really that that, uh, that strong. The impact is not uh, uh, immediate and very clear. As you, sometimes there are El Nino years where you have, uh, uh, in some places, uh, above average rainfall and uh, uh, slight below average rainfall in others and so on. And it's never in the same place. Uh, I should say that uh, there are also uh, uh, some um uh, uh local drivers uh, but that they don't play a uh, big role either uh, uh like uh, amo the uh, atlantic uh, multidecal oscillation as well as the uh we notice also that if, when there is a basin wide warming over the ocean in the indian ocean that also uh have some impact and it's uh, related to uh uh, uh good rainy season and for this uh the, this slide is for the current rainy season uh, as you can see, uh, the anomaly, which is in the left side, left hand side, uh, uh, most of the region actually is uh, either uh, gray color, which is uh, average, or green above average. You have a few areas like this uh, Mauritania Mali uh, border area, uh, that's southeastern Mauritania. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Niger uh, Burkina Faso uh, border area. Uh, the eastern Niger and uh, northeastern Nigeria, and so on. But uh, really, uh, the season is mostly average to above average. Uh, um, it's from localized um, area of deficit. Okay, uh, we try to let, take a look at the uh, more details in terms of uh, uh, time. And we have here the, the monthly uh, anomaly in percent of average uh, combined with the uh, dry, the, 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 the length of dry spells. And as you could see, uh, really, if the situation is not, uh, when you look at it globally, uh, no problem, basically. Uh, however, I like to, to uh, take time and talk to you about the July and September uh, cases. Uh, the July case, uh, why well, I like to talk about it, because uh, 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 particularly in the Sahel, where the season uh, the length of the sea growing season is is, is limited. Uh, uh, it causes uh, when it causes uh, planting delays uh, that could have an impact, uh, particularly on the um, uh, photoperiod sensitive crops. Like uh, most of our cereal crops are photosensitive, photoperiod sensitive, and that could uh, uh, result in, in in a significant uh, drop. And you can see, it, like southern Mali. Uh, this area of uh, southwestern Burkina Faso, northeastern uh, Niger, and uh, and also uh, the September uh, area. You could also see uh, in central uh, Burkina Faso and uh, central north Nigeria, as well as the eastern Niger and eastern Nigeria, and this western uh, uh, northwestern Niger area, uh, as well as in Mali. You have either uh, uh, severe dry. Uh, uh, a severe deficit in terms of rainfall, or uh, a significant, uh, uh, significant long dry spell, and that in, in both cases. So the September why is it important because it coincides with um, um, the reproductive phase of most crops, and that also where the crops are very more sensitive dryness than in a, any other uh, period uh, of their uh, phase of their the, the, uh, cycle. 
Um, uh, uh, next, please. Uh, so this is basically the uh, uh, a summary of what I just uh, said about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, including August. Uh, but in August, uh, I did not talk about uh, uh, in length about the dryness because August uh, rainfall is usually way above average and it's usually way above uh, the crop um, um, uh, water requirements. Uh, however, there are also some areas that experience some problems during August. And uh, uh, what I want to uh, just uh, focus on is again July and September. And those areas that are um, uh, listed in the July and September cases are uh, very likely to uh, experience some uh, significant uh, drop in yield. Uh, however, there is a word of caution. And the word of caution is that for September, particularly where we use CHIRP without S, uh, C H I R P. And uh, without the because recently we had problem with the uh, uh, automatic stations uh, reporting uh, the reported uh, no rain, but in fact there is uh, rain uh, 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 in the in the ground, and uh, that caused some pro estimate problems. So now we've been using chip instead of chips preliminary. Um, uh, so for September we haven't had yet uh, uh, chips final is not available yet. So the situation could slightly change from this one. So this is only the word of caution. So we will we'll get it done, we'll done where as soon as we get uh, uh, or uh, the chips uh, final becomes available and we'll see. But uh, usually there is, the change is, is not really uh, significant, uh, but we, we expect some changes that to all these areas, maybe some of them would not uh, be like, uh, uh, look uh, uh, as dry as they are when we receive the final chips. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, with this, I will leave to my colleague Lita to continue with the uh, acute food insecurity implications. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Akhalil. Um, my name is Lita Branham, and I'm a senior food security analyst and regional lead for West Africa. Um, for those of you that may need to jump off, um, the key takeaway for West Africa is that El Nino has a minimal impact on food security in West Africa. Uh, so taking a little bit closer look at, at what we mean by that. Um, first, looking at the seasonal calendar in a typical year for West Africa, in northern regions, particularly in the Sahel, the rainy season and uh, main growing season run roughly from June to August, which coincided with the weak to moderate El Nino in 2023. And as Al-Khalil has explained, the El Nino really had a minimal impact on crop development throughout this past growing season. Most importantly, the strong El Nino uh, coincides with the main, off, uh, the main and off-season harvests between October and April when crops have already reached maturation. And then looking into 2024, uh, the El Nino is expected to dissipate prior to the onset of the 2024 main rainy season next June. Next slide, please. Um, so Al Khalil has already gone uh, into detail on um, rainfall this year, so I'll keep this brief. But this is taking a quick look at the CHIRP's rainfall performance during cultivation from uh, May to August, um, where rainfall was broadly um, average to slightly above average throughout the region. Though um, it's worth noting that the generally below average rainfall observed in September is not accounted for in this map. Now, it's worth noting that several areas saw, oh, sorry, Benja, can you please go back? Thanks. Um, it's just uh, important to note that several areas saw a delayed start to the rainy season in June and poorly distributed rainfall um, with some localized deficits in June and July did lead to some delays in crop development in many areas. However, the improved rainfall that we saw in August allowed for much of the region to more or less rebound from these early season deficits. Um, this is particularly the case in southern Mali, eastern Burkina Faso, southern Niger, and parts of North Central and Northeast Nigeria. Next slide. So taking a quick look at crop production estimates, um, 
The current consensus is that staple cereal production is expected to be near average or just slightly below average in the Sahel. The graph on the left here is showing the Prajek provisional crop estimates for most of Fusenet's monitored countries in the region. Um, and as you can see, estimates are consistently either near average or slightly above average across the region for, 23, for 2023 and 2024 main season cultivation. Though I would note that these estimates were made prior to the um, September rainfall um, deficits. So we could expect to see some, some decline, though uh, the consensus remains for broadly average uh, pro regional production. Looking at the geoglam on the map, this shows regional cropping conditions and the main drivers of production of poor production in the region. And as you can see, the primary factors constraining agriculture production in the Sahel are not climate related, but rather are primarily conflict and economic factors such as persisting high agricultural input prices. So as such, Fusenet is anticipating crop production deficits in conflict affected areas during this upcoming season. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our key takeaway is that El Nino has not had a significant impact on acute food insecurity in West Africa and conflict does remain the key driver of acute food insecurity in the region. Um, Burkina Faso remains one of the countries of highest concern, not just for West Africa, but among FUSNET's monitored countries as Jibo municipality in Sioux province continues to face a risk of famine. We also expect emergency IPC phase four outcomes in Burkina Faso, um, specifically in Sum, Yaga, and Udalan provinces, and emergency outcomes in Northeast Nigeria. We also expect crisis outcomes in several other conflict-affected areas, particularly in the Liptako Gorma region uh, and the Lake Chad Basin, as well as parts of Northwest and North Central Nigeria and areas of Chad that are hosting Sudanese refugees. Now, overall, across most of the non-conflict affected areas of the region, households are gaining income and food stocks from the ongoing harvests, and in agro-pastoral areas, pasture conditions remain largely favorable. So as such, we anticipate pretty widespread stressed IPC phase two and minimal IPC phase one outcomes throughout most of the region. Next slide, please. Lastly, FUSENET prepares approximated humanitarian food assistance need estimates for countries it monitors, and the graphic here shows estimated population in need in FUSENET's countries in West Africa from June 2023 through March 2024. And it's important to note that the estimated humanitarian population in need peaked between June and September of this year, ranging from 20 to 25 million people in the region. And this number is expected to decrease seasonally in line with the harvest, particularly between October and January. And as reiterated throughout our portion of the presentation, El Nino has not impacted our food assistance needs in West Africa. Uh, that's all from my si side. Um, just a keynote on key takeaways. Overall, our concern for acute food insecurity remains highest in conflict and drought affected parts of East Africa and conflict affected parts of West Africa. And we anticipate emergency IPC phase four outcomes are projected in many of these areas. The areas of highest concern uh, for Fusenet are in Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, and South Sudan. Um, all three countries continue to face a risk of famine. Uh, our key takeaways regarding acute food insecurity impacts specific to El Nino include that in Southern Africa, below average cumulative rainfall during the October to March rainy season is expected to limit agricultural labor opportunities and result in a below average 2024 harvest. And reduced access to food is a concern in deficit producing areas, particularly in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, and Southern Madagascar. Now turning to East Africa, below average rainfall in Kremt receiving areas of Ethiopia is contributing to below average crop production. And in the Eastern Horn, the October to December rains are expected to support above average crop and livestock production in most areas and improve household access to food and income. However, floods in flood prone riverine and low lying areas, especially in Somalia, are expected to cause displacement, agricultural production losses and increased disease incidents. Finally, in West Africa, the El Nino is expected to have minimal impacts on acute food insecurity and conflict remains the main driver of acute food insecurity. This is particularly the case for Burkina Faso and Northeast Nigeria. With that, we are happy to conclude and apologies for running a, a little bit over and we're happy to answer any questions. 
Um, we would just note that our colleagues for East Africa had to jump off for another briefing. Um, so if there are any questions specific to East Africa, we're happy to note them. Uh, if you wouldn't mind dropping them in the chat, we'll note them down and make sure our colleagues from East Africa are able to follow up with you directly. Thank you, Lita. Uh, and thank you to all the presenters uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. And again, for those who are able and willing to stick on for any, maybe a question or two, we welcome that. Um, if not, of course, please feel free to drop questions in the chat or reach out to me directly. Um, and I'll make sure that those questions are, are fielded to our experts on the team. Thank you. <laughs>